Hello and welcome back everyone, this is Dawn. In today's video, we're gonna be creating three cards and all three of these feature my newest stamp set with Honeybee Stamps. This is the Storybook Fall Set. I wanted to create a stamp set where you could easily create full scene cards. So you've got your main characters, you've got uh, elements for them to interact with, and then you've also got some things to help you create your background. My medium of choice today is Copics. I just thought that the vibrancy of the color with Copic markers uh, was really going to pair well with these super sweet images. And we're creating a nice fall scene, which is when all the colors are popping. So it just made sense to me. Now with Copics, I uh, prefer the Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound super smooth cardstock. I find that Copics always look incredibly vibrant on this paper and I'm using the pink fresh detail black ink to do my stamping so I've loaded all of these onto my misty we're going to stamp them out and I'm actually going to stamp two panels I almost always stamp multiples of my images that way if I make a mistake on one of them I have an extra already stamped out and I can just recolor it but this is going to give me lots of uh, finished pieces and that's how we ended up with three cards now let's jump right into our coloring. I've been a very bad, uh, very bad crafter and I haven't been taking care of my Copic markers. You can see here on the screen we're using E30, E42, E33, and E39 for our tree. Now if you've been Copic coloring or you've, uh, are you familiar with Copic coloring, a lot of people will tell you to choose um, like an E33, an E35, an E39. So keeping within the same color family and then within the same number system to a part. I've been a really bad crafter. I have not taken care of my Copic markers. In fact, I probably, it's been, I probably went four or five years without using them regularly. So a lot of mine have dried up and crusted over and I need to replace a lot. That means I had to get very creative and make what I had that was still usable work together. And you'll see in the finished cards that it was completely doable and I'm absolutely happy with the results. Now my method is usually to start with my mid-tone or my shadow color and map in my shadows, which is what I started out doing here on the tree. So I use that E39 to map in all of my darkest areas and I just used the lines that I had illustrated in the stamp set as my guide. And then I grabbed the E33 and I'm using that to extend that color. So I'm starting with, I'm starting where I put down the E39 and then bringing that E33 in to fill in more of the tree. And then I used the E30 and realized quickly that that was too light. So I grabbed the E42 and I'm gonna fill in the rest of the tree with that E42. Now once I've got my first layer of color down, I give it a second for that alcohol. Uh, Copic markers are alcohol based, so it is wetting the paper and the wet paper is going to appear darker. Once that alcohol evaporates, the colors will get a little lighter. So I then come back and reinforce or deepen up any areas that need to be darker. And truthfully, I could have stopped here. I'm not going to because um, I can't help myself, <laughs> but... I always reevaluate and then I can come in and put down another layer of color to add more depth and dimension wherever I want to. And this is pretty much my methodology for Copic coloring uh, and I'll use this on most all of these images. The exception would be smaller objects, so the apples and the leaves. I'll have a slightly different method there and you'll see that when we get to those. And we're going to color a little bit if not all of every image in here and I'm going to be swap I'm going to be switching back and forth between real time and fast motion coloring can get very um, repetitive and monotonous but I do want to share a little bit if not all of the coloring for each of the images plus remember I'm working with a limited color palette here because I was bad and I haven't taken care of my supplies but that's okay. Sometimes a limited color palette can be a blessing in disguise because it's going to ensure that all of your colors are harmonious throughout the entire scene. So I'm going to continue with the same method to finish coloring this tree. And now we're going to jump into doing the leaves and the apples. Now this is where I mentioned that we're going to take a slightly different approach. For the leaves, I'm only going to be using two colors, YG11 and YG17. So YG11 has a lot of the alcohol base and a smaller amount of colorant, whereas the YG17 has a lot of the colorant and less of the alcohol base. 
So I'm going to start by putting a dot of the YG17 at the base of each of my leaves. You could color the entire leaf with the YG17 if you want. I'm a little extra. So I'm going to grab that YG11 and now I'm going to pull that color out to the rest of the leaf. So you'll see that that YG17 is lightening significantly and it's moving with the YG11 and that is because we have more alcohol base in the YG11 and alcohol is how you would remove this color. So we're using that YG11 to move and pull that YG17 out further. And just like I did with the tree, I'm gonna come through and add another layer just to deepen up areas that I feel need a little bit more depth, a little bit more shadow. Now that that is done, we're gonna move on to our apples. For that, I'm gonna use R20, R24, and R37. This time I'm gonna start with my mid-tone, my R24, and I'm gonna fill in my shadow, and then I'm gonna use my lightest color to fill in the rest of my apple. This will allow me time to evaluate where I need to put more shadow without going too dark too fast. And I'm gonna slow this down here in a minute. So we're gonna zoom in and we're gonna slow it down and I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm doing. So I'm gonna take that R24, I'm gonna lay in just a little bit of where I want my color to be the darkest eventually, and then I'm gonna blend that out with my lighter color. Now I will eventually come in with my R37, but first I'm gonna do all of my apples exactly the same way. I'm gonna do the mid-tone as my darkest color, and then I'm gonna fill in the rest with my R20. Because we're working in such a small little area here, if I wanna retain that highlight and really accentuate the roundness of the apple, I need to make sure that I don't eat up all of my highlight with my darkest color. By not introducing that darkest deep dark yet, I ensure that I still have at least one level that I can go darker. I'm also going to, you'll notice that I'm kind of using the exact same light source for all of the apples. I am generally have an upper left hand light source in my mind, but I'm not worried about you know getting it completely accurate you guys i just generally have that light source in my head and that way i can just go ahead and use that as my map for coloring all of my apples so now that that first layer is down here is where i'm going to come in with that r37 and then blend all of my colors out again i'm using that r37 very judiciously here just a couple of little dots and then using that r24 to pull that little dot out and then blending if necessary with my R20. It's a very easy technique, but because we're working in a very small area, this may take some practice. All right, so with the apples done, we're gonna move on to our barrel here, and we're gonna use the same colors that we used for our tree. And similarly to the way we did the apples, we're gonna start with our mid-tone. The mid-tone is pretty much the color of your object. It's the one that you should see the most of. So I'm gonna go ahead and map in all of my shadows here. The bottom of the barrel is going to be darker than the top because we've got that nice little metal trim around it. And then here again, just kind of keeping in my mind a general light source of the upper left-hand corner, I'm going to map in where the barrel would be darkest, leaving that white edge there for my lightest color. Now I'm gonna come in with that E39 and I'm gonna deepen up what would be my true shadow areas. So because the barrel is round, we're going to deepen up each of the sides, but we're not gonna deepen up that right side or that left side too much because again, our light source is coming from that area. We want shadow over there, but we want it to be a little bit lighter than the shadow on the right side. So always make sure that you're matching your shadow depths appropriately for your light source. And now we take that E53, I'm gonna run that across the top, and then I will take the E39 and add a little bit of depth between each of these planks. Because I've illustrated the wood grain into the actual image there, I don't have to worry about trying to create wood grain with my Copics, I'll let the illustration there do the work for us. I colored the apples the exact same way and now it's time to do our dog. Now here I'm going to borrow some of the colors from our tree, the E33, and now I'm going to add in E53 and E50. So this is going to, it's gonna keep that E33 as a color, uh, as a constant color between all of our browns, but I'm gonna be able to achieve a much lighter brown. So I'm gonna map in my shadows here. Our E33 really isn't that dark, so it's not scary to go ahead and just map in my shadows with the darkest color here. Plus I'm 
pretty confident with coloring the pup here. So I, I just went straight in with my E33. And if he turned out a little darker, it was okay, right? Um, dogs come in all shades, so it's fine. So I mapped in those shadows. Then I'm gonna pull those shadows out with my mid-tone, the E53. So we're just going to go over where we put down the E33 and pull out that color so that we fill in a little bit more of our pup. You'll see here I'm coming around his head. I'll come out closer to the center of his face, but I'm leaving a lot of white area there. And that's where I'm going to come in with the E50 and fill in everything else. So here you can see, I'm just gonna go over all of the open white space and soften some of that transitions from that transition from the E53 into the E50. Now I can come in and reevaluate any shadows, deepen up any areas that I think need to be a little bit deeper. And again, I'm not going to deepen up every shadow, just the areas that I think need to be a little bit darker. There's always going to be variation in your depth of shadows as well. So don't feel like you have to go over every shadow area again. Leave some of your shadows lighter and then some of your shadows really deep and that's how you're gonna create a lot of depth in your image. So that finishes up our little pup here. I did go ahead and color in the other pup, but now I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do the overalls. I've got B32, B34, and B97. So, I mean, I told you things can get monotonous, just like before. We're gonna map in our shadows, our deepest darks here. And for that, I'm using that B97. Here on his tush, it's sitting on the ground, so there's going to be no reflected light. A lot of the times when you're doing round objects, you'll leave a light edge on that object. Well, his butt is on the ground, so there's no way for light to bounce back and come from behind to light that edge. So you don't even have to worry about that. I just went straight to the line there, and now I'm gonna be bring in that B34 and extend out that color. So again, this B34 is going to be our main color, so it's gonna be the color you see the most of and then B32 to just finish off those highlights. So I'm telling you, rinse and repeat. Now just pick out some shadows to reinforce and deepen up. So this is really a great illustration of how my methodology is pretty much the same. It varies a little bit, but mostly um, I'm using the same methodology for every image. And then I'm just varying uh, the amount of shadow or where the shadows are and then the color choices really. So once you get that methodology down, you can apply it to anything that you're coloring. So I used that same blue on our birds. Uh, I used the same red that I used for our apples on our other little doggies um, handkerchief. And then here for our little canvas face of our scarecrow here, I'm using the same color combination that I used on our, our pup there that we've colored. So E53, E50, and E33. So that's really gonna, again, repeat those colors throughout our, our composition here. For his hair, we're gonna use the same colors that I used to do the hay bales. So that's YR24, YR23, and YR21. That's what I used for the scarecrow's hands and feet, for the hay bales, and now for his hair. So again, we're just repeating the same colors on different elements, and by swapping out how much we use of each color, we can change the uh, overall color, right? Um, it'll still be the same hue, but we're changing how light or dark that color is. Here for his hat, we're using the same colors that we used for the barrel and the tree. I'm going to make the under rim of his hat, the underneath of that rim there, it's going to be all in shadow, so it will be the darkest. And then again, just leaving that uh, highlight there on the upper left hand corner. And I finished coloring our scarecrow off screen. His overalls were done the exact same way that we did our little pups overalls. And then his red shirt was using the exact same color that we used for the apples. So uh, there was really no need to go over that again, all the same steps. Once I had everything colored in, I used the coordinating die here to cut everything out. And remember, I did stamp two of these and then I colored a couple extra images off of that second sheet so that I could cut those as well. Uh, a lot of the times I would practice my color combo on the first sheet and if it came out, you know, came out decent, then I was able to go ahead and use it, which is how I ended up with so many pieces and subsequently three different cards, but I'm not mad about it, you guys. Now, I know that we said in thumbnail, this is beginner friendly. Uh, the coloring could be considered probably maybe intermediate, 
but the background. The background is where we're beginner friendly because a lot of the times we can color these little images because we have our lines, but creating the scenery to house or the or to ground all of our elements can be a little intimidating. So I'm gonna show you two very easy beginner friendly ways to um, ground our scene, right? So here I'm gonna take a five by seven card panel these images are generously sized, so you can you can easily color them and they will fill up a five by seven card if you so choose. We will also be doing two A2 cards, which are four and a quarter by five and a half, but I wanted to show you how much bang you get for your buck with these images and how you can create an extremely full scene on even a five by seven card. Now you'll notice I have two trees in my scene. Don't worry, I'm not gonna waste a tree because these are going off the page, I can cut one of those trees in half and use it on either side. So here I've got my um, I've got my scene laid out. Now I need to mark my horizon line because it's time to add in our background to ground all of this, right? It's kind of floating right now. So I'm gonna grab a pencil and I'm gonna make a mark for where I want my ground to end and my sky to begin. So I'm just making a light pencil mark. And then I'm gonna move my tree out of the way here and we're gonna pick up the rest of this arrangement with some press and seal. And we're gonna lay that off to the side while we work on our background. And for this first card, we're gonna do some ink blending. That's gonna be the easiest way. I've taken my T-square ruler, I've created my horizon line, and now I'm gonna use some post-it masking tape here to tape off my ground while I add in my sky. And I am placing my tape slightly above my pencil mark. I want to be able to erase this after I'm done. I don't want to trap that line under the ink. So I just put that post-it tape down slightly above my line so it's covering it. And now I'm using a little bit of broken china to ink blend in my sky. I'm gonna go very light to start. I don't know exactly how deep I want this yet so I can always build up that color but once I go darker um, I can't take it away. So I'm gonna slowly build this up until I get the depth that I want. You saw me put my tree down there just to test how the colors looked with each other. I was happy with it, but I said, yeah, it does need to be a little bit darker to support that vibrant color of the tree. I removed my tape, I'm erasing that pencil line, and then I'm gonna put that post-it tape back down. This time I'm going to cover the sky portion and I'm going right on top of that skyline. So, and then I'm gonna come in and add my my ground. So this was gonna. This is gonna be the grass. For that, I'm using some mowed lawn distress ink, and here I'm just covering the rest of this cardstock with that green. Does not matter if this is a smooth blend. In fact, if it's a little blotchy, that's fine. This is supposed to be grass, right? So we're gonna have variations in color. You're gonna have some darker green, some lighter green. Um, this is just gonna add to the um, authenticity. It's gonna give you a little texture without you having to do anything extra. So there, we've got our ground and our sky. Super, super easy, super fast. Now look at the difference when we put our die cuts down. Now we have a ground for them to be sitting on and we have a sky in the background. Right now, those white borders on those die cuts are killing me. <laughs> this is never used to be a problem for me. I never used to mind. However, we do have a lot of um, images here. So there's a lot of white border, and I think that's what was killing me on this one. So we're going to use a trick eventually from my bestie Kelly, and I'll show you how to get rid of those if you haven't already seen it. I'm gonna glue down that tree on the side. The portion that's hanging off, I'm gonna use my trimmer to trim that off right along the edge. This is gonna give me another half of that tree here to lay on the other side. So I'm gonna reposition all of my uh, my little scene here back down and I'm gonna pick that tree back up and then I can use my press and seal to adhere everything down. Now you guys know the drill. Um, I'm gonna use a mix of liquid adhesive and foam adhesive. Uh, we're not gonna go through the whole thing, but just know I went ahead and adhered everything down and now our scene is ready for the finishing touches. You could leave this, stop here, add your sentiment and be done. However, um, my background just felt like it was a little flat. So I'm gonna grab this little grass piece here. This I included this in the set so you could uh, add in a little bit of texture to your ground wherever you wanted it. 
I'm going to stamp a couple out here on scratch paper. That way I can use the die cut to die cut it. And then I'm going to stamp a couple directly on my background. Again, this is just going to add some of that illustration to our ink blended background. So it's going to kind of bridge the die cut, um, the die cut images here that we colored with the background that we ink blended. Now we're going to address those uh, white edges of our die cut. I usually, like I said, don't mind these, but I think because we have so many images here and we are sitting on an ink blended background, uh, they just kind of stood out a lot to me. But it's easy to blend those in with our background by just using our Copic markers to color all of those white borders. I just picked color that matched closely, which happened to be the YG, was it, is it the YG11 that we used to do our leaves? So it was uh, a color I'm already using in my scene and it camouflages them quite nicely. Also, because I used a little bit of foam tape to pop up some of these items, they're casting a natural shadow underneath them. So I don't even have to worry too much about creating a shadow for each of my things either. I can just add a little bit of extra color underneath uh, the die cuts there, and then it kind of gives the illusion of a shadow that is reinforced by the actual physical shadow of the dimension of the die cut. So kind of a little cheat there. And then where two die cuts are sitting on top of each other, like where our uh, little pup here is sitting on these apples, I'm just going to camouflage that white border with some red and pink, kind of continue those apples so that you can't tell that um, you had a white border there. I'm just blending that in with the apples that he was sitting on. I went ahead and die cut those little grass clumps there and I'm going to use a little bit of foam adhesive to uh, pop these up in front of our little haystack in front of the barrel and then that will pretty much finish off this card. All that's left is to add our sentiment and mount it to our card base. So we're going to review that at the end but for now let's jump into our next card. And for this one, we, I've already gone ahead and laid out my arrangement here. I absolutely adore this card. And I went back and forth about whether to add a background to this or not. I do like it on the white. But in the end, I did decide that I would show you a second way to quickly and easily ground these items so that they don't look like they're floating. And this time we're going to use our Copic markers to do it. We're going to use the um, one of the blues that we've already used in our scene, and we're going to use the greens that we've already used in our scene. Now this time we're going to just color directly on our card base, to, and we're not going to worry about filling this edge to edge. Uh, we're going to put in our, like a halo background. It's going to be like a spotlighted background. I'm going to color in my area for my ground, I'm using that YG11 to just map in where I want my ground to be. So here you could take this out as far as you wanted. I'm going to make sure that I'm taking it out to at least all the characters in my scene. And this is why I haven't glued down any of my elements yet. I don't want to have to work around my die cuts like I did in the last one. So I'm going to go ahead and start mapping in my ground here and adding in my ground before I adhere the rest of my elements. And you can see here that I'm just adding little spots of darker color here and there with that YG17, and then I'm gonna use that YG11 to just kind of smooth it out in some places, and I'm gonna leave them a little bit more harsh and defined in other areas. I'm just creating the suggestion of a background. I'm not gonna finish it. I'm not making sure that the edges are completely rounded or squared off or any of that. I'm gonna just kind of let it bleed off into white. And I'm gonna continually flip my uh, press and seal back and forth here so I can see exactly how far I need to go down with my ground. So here I wanna make sure that I've got it under my barrel and my little apples that are on there on the, that are on the ground there. So I'm just kind of flipping it back and forth to check to make sure and I'm like, yep, that's good, that'll do you. And then I'm gonna do the exact same thing for the sky. So I'm gonna grab the, I think I used the B00 for this. And then I'm going to just kind of fill in a portion of the sky in the background. Again, I'm not gonna go all the way to the top of the tree. This time I'm not gonna go all the way out edge to edge. I'm just gonna create kind of like a little spotlight there around the main portion of the trunk. And this is going to give the, um, illusion that there is more ground and more sky. Again, I'm going to let those edges fade out to white. This is just a great way to uh, create the suggestion of a larger scene without you having to add in a whole lot of scenery and 
requires zero illustration skills. You just got to chunk that color in there to give that suggestion that we you're looking at part of a larger scene. As for the borders of the die cut, I'm only blending in the borders that are directly on top of the colored area. So the top of the tree where it's laying over the white paper, I'm not worried about the borders of that die cut. They're going to blend into the background. And then the areas on these limbs, the apples and such, where they're laying over the blue sky, I'm just going to blend those edges of the die cut into the blue sky. That's it. I absolutely love this one. Um, this is this is probably my favorite technique for grounding and adding a background to a scene card. And you can get as detailed with it as you want. Like you could add in some little flowers or indications of some little flowers on the ground. You could add in um, the look of clouds back there. You could uh, add some texture to the ground. Really, it's up to you to get as creative as you want. But really, this is just a great jumping off point, a good starting point for beginners to really start creating that environment for your scene cards that requires very little, um, very little advanced skill. But you can advance it as far as you'd like. That's why I just really love this one. It's very versatile and it is great, uh, a great technique for expanding upon. So finally, we're just going to adhere all of our little pieces down to finish out our scene. And then just like we did with our tree, where we blended it into the background, I'm going to do the same thing on the borders of these die cuts, just blending them into the areas where they're actually laying over color. Anywhere those borders are laying over a white background, I'm not going to bother with blending them in. So that is pretty much going to finish up this card as well. Let's go ahead and take a look at all of the cards because I did create a third and final card using this exact same technique. All right, so here are the three finished cards. First up, we have our large five by seven scene card. I did add a couple of uh, finishing touches off camera. I did a little bit of glossy accents on that main apple that he's offering up to that scarecrow. And then I added a black jelly roll pin to their eyes and their noses just for a little dimension. But I absolutely love the way this turned out. It's got so much color, so much. There's a lot going on, but it's not overly busy because we kept that background super simple using that ink blending. And then our sentiment here really stands out because we left it with the white border, which ties in the white card base. Now, the second card here, this is probably my favorite. I really love this simple background here. We just kind of had it halo out from behind the tree there faded off into white, didn't worry about coloring in those die cut edges where it laid over white, but blended them in where they laid over color. I just love that sentiment as well. Seasons change, but true friends remain. And I added a little sparkling glitter to every red element on this card. So when you tilt it in the light, all of the red has that little shimmer. Um, finally, I had a couple die cuts left over and I just threw them together for a quick little card here. I love this one too. Hey friend, I'd never bail on you. <laughs> so cute. So here I did that exact same, uh, just that spotlight background there. And then I just layered my die cuts on top of it. And this time I didn't even bother blending in the edges. I wanted to show you that it looks cute even if you don't do that. And again, that sparkle pin on everything blue in this card. So I hope that you enjoyed today's video. If you did, don't forget to give this a thumbs up. I'd love to know which of these cards is your favorite and which background technique is your favorite. Let me know in the comments below. If you're looking for any of the supplies featured in today's video, you'll find them in the description box. And as always, I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.